Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil McGregor, and I'm the Assistant Manager for Art Exhibitions and Outreach for Heritage Doncaster. It's lovely to be able to talk to you this evening, and thanks to Art UK and Bloomberg Philanthropies for giving me this opportunity to share some of our fabulous collection with you. Before we go any further, just a little bit about me. My own background is as an artist. I trained at Norwich School of Art under Edward Middleditch, John Lesore and John Wanacott, and I'm still making my own paintings. I've been in this role for around 12 years, and as well as looking after the fine and decorative arts collection cared for by Heritage Doncaster, I also organise our temporary exhibition programme. I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about the home of Heritage Doncaster, which is the Danem Gallery, Library and Museum, known to the staff as the D-Glam. The building opened in May 2021. The building is an adaption of an Edwardian girls high school, which has had a library, museum, rail heritage centre and art gallery added to the back of it. One of the striking features of the building is that the school frontage has been wrapped around with glass. This photo shows an image of the, of the building at night. I'll just show a few photos of the inside of the building to give you a better sense of it. This photo shows the cafe area with the, with the girls' high school frontage forming the backdrop. On the lower ground floor is the rail heritage area, which includes two Doncaster built locomotives on loan from the National Railway Museum. On the left of this photo is Green Arrow, and to the right is number 251 Atlantic. In the background, you can see a large display of railway nameplates. These are from a private collection that was built up by ex pupils of Doncaster Grammar School. Previously, the collection was stored in a disused water tower at that school. This next photo shows the collection in its original home, in what was probably the most chaotic collection of objects you've ever seen. On the top floor of the D-Glam are the art galleries. This photo shows the main space in which our, we, we display our permanent collection. Off to the side, we have a smaller gallery, which is used for community-based exhibitions. We also have a temporary exhibition space, which for the first time in Doncaster gives us a gallery that meets government indemnity standards. This is an image of that gallery with a touring exhibition from the British Museum on display. A little bit about the collection, which contains just over 2000 works, including paintings, prints, drawings, sculptures, and some photographs. The earliest painting dates from around 1700 and is by an unknown Dutch artist, Sprotra Hall which was a local stately home. The most recent are prints and photographs by some of the YBAs, including Sarah Lucas and Simon Patterson. Particular strengths of the collection are works on paper from the 20th century, including by Henry Moore, Patrick Colfield, Maggie Hamling and Dame Laura Knight. There is also a large group of works on paper by Sir Frank Brangwyn, many of which were donated by the artist. The sculpture collection, although small in number, contains some of our most significant works, and includes works by Jacob Epstein and Frank Dobson. Many of these were donated to the collection in 1963 by the Contemporary Art Society to celebrate the opening of our previous museum. The collection has been built up from a mixture of gifts, purchases and bequests with a number of works found in store. At one point there was quite a healthy purchase budget but that ended in the 1990s and now if we wish to acquire a work we are reliant on grant funding. Grant funders over the years have included the Art Fund, the v &A Purchase Grant Fund and the Heritage Lottery Fund. The Contemporary Art Society have also been a source of some of our important works. We are now particularly reliant on our Friends organisation for support with acquisitions. One recent purchase is a sculpture by Doncaster artist Malcolm Woodward, Malcolm Woodward who was a studio assistant to Henry Moore. This was acquired through funding from the v &A Purchase Grant Fund, match fund by our Friends, by our friends organisation. I've chosen six artworks to talk about. I've selected them either because they're personal favourites or they're because they tell us something about Doncaster and its history or because there is an interesting story behind them. It would have been easy for me to have chosen another 50 images but you'll have to visit us to see the rest of our collection. I'm going to start with this painting by Joseph Wright of Derby of William Brooke. The picture was painted in 1760 and is on the scale of life, so roughly four foot tall. 
William Brooke was an extremely important figure in 18th century Doncaster. He was mayor of the town three times during the 1730s and 1750s and instrumental in the commissioning of the town's mansion house. At the time this portrait was painted, he was around 66 years old. Although Brooke was an important figure in Doncaster's history, he was in fact born in London and it would be interesting to know what brought him up north. What we do know is that he was in Doncaster by the 1720s and was living in the market area of the town where he traded as a dealer in fabric. This interest in fabric, in fabric is reflected in his beautiful velvet suit. He is shown in a robust and confident pose while holding a small book in his left hand, which we think might be a pattern book listing the products that he sold. The portrait is one of a group of three portraits that Wright painted of the same family during his visit to Doncaster. <clears throat> the other two portraits are of William Brooks' daughter Elizabeth in the middle of this group and husband William Piggott. William Piggott was also a dealer in fabric and was the son of Horace Piggott, who was the vicar of St George's Church in the town, while Elizabeth, who was shown in a fashionable silk dress, died not, died not long after her portrait was painted, shortly after giving birth to her sixth child. As I mentioned earlier, Brooke had been involved in the commissioning of Doncaster's Mansion House, which is one of only three mansion houses in the country, and here is a picture of that beautiful building. He was commissioned by the Corporation for Municipal Entertainment and to help develop Doncaster as a social centre. It was designed by James Payne and built between 1745 and 1749. Until recently, the building housed the council chambers, but it's now mainly run by its friends organisation and has concerts, afternoon teas and dinner dances, a bit like it did when it was first opened. Just a little bit about the artist Joseph Wright of Derby. When he visited Doncaster in 1760, he had not long completed his training in the studio of Thomas Hudson. The three portraits were created on a painting tour of the North Midlands, which Wright undertook in 1759 and 1760 when he also visited Lincoln, Boston, Retford and Thorne. During that tour, Wright records a total of 53 sitters, but apart from the Doncaster portraits and the ones painted in Retford, none of the other pictures are now known. We know from Wright's account book that he charged six guineas for a half-length portrait and three guineas for a head and shoulders. So although he was just setting out on his career, he was already doing quite well for himself. When I look at our portraits, I always get the feeling that Wright enjoyed painting it. I get the sense that Brooke, although successful, was a straightforward character who, judging by his reddish face, enjoyed the good things in life. He was the sort of character that Wright was to paint throughout his life and who you feel he was at home with. And it reminds me of the portraits of inventors and industrialists that Wright painted later in his career. The portrait stayed as a group with the Piggott family until the 1980s, when they were sold at auction and separated. They were brought back together in the 1990s by the London dealer, Mallet, and offered for sale. The pictures were due to be sold abroad until Heritage Doncaster was able to block the export licence, allowing time to raise funds to bring the paintings home. There was a successful funding bid, including to the v &A Purchase Grant Fund, the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Art Fund. The Friends of Doncaster Museum also contributed. Finally, I'd like to mention the frames, which are original to the paintings. They are by John Duborg, a Huguenot frame maker who was working in London during the middle of the 18th century. It would be hard to talk about Doncaster without mentioning horses and horse racing. For, so for my next painting, I've chosen this amazing image entitled A Yearling Sale at Doncaster by Lois Cato Dickinson. The picture was painted in 1885 and measures just over eight feet in width. The subject of the painting is the annual sale of yearling horses organised by Tattersall's Auctioneers, which were held in Doncaster every September to coincide with the St. Leisure Horse Racing Festival. Coincidentally, the scene of the painting, an area of ground known as Glasgow Paddocks, was on almost exactly the same site as the Dane Gallery is now. The painting is what is known as a subscription picture meaning that everyone in the painting has paid to be included. The more money you paid, the more prominent your position. There are 149 named individuals in the painting, with most of them having some connection to the racing industry. Helpfully for the viewer, when the painting is on display, there is a key next to it which names all the people in the painting. Before we have a closer look at some of the individuals, just something about the artist. 
Lois Cato Dickinson was born in London and started out working for his father's firm as a lithographer. Later, the family firm branched out into photography and became photographers to Queen Victoria. Dickinson was associated with the pre-Raphaelites and taught alongside Rossetti and Ruskin. He also had a studio in the same building as Ford Maddox Brown. He created a few subscription pictures, including one of the lawn at Goodwood, which is in the collection of Walston Manor in Buckinghamshire, and one of Gladstone's cabinet, which is in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. Now on to some of the characters in the painting. I suppose I ought to start with the auctioneer, the gentleman in the grey topper. He is Edmund Tadsell and was head of Tadsell's auctioneers at the time the picture was painted. Next to him on the rostrum is his son Edmund Somerville Tadsell. He was a key figure in the company for 57 years and was senior partner between 1898 and 1932. He was also the last member of the family to direct the company. Behind them is Hamar Bass. He was a member of the Bass Brewing family and was MP, MP for Tamworth and West Staffordshire. He was also a breeder at the Berkeley Stud and his horse Love Wisely won the Ascot Gold Cup in 1896. Moving on to the next slide, we have from left to right, Viscountess Newport, who was born at Tickhill Castle near Doncaster. She was the daughter of the ninth Earl of Scarborough whose family seat is at Sandbeck Hall near Doncaster. Next to her is her husband, Viscount Newport, who was the fourth Earl of Bradford. He was MP for North Shropshire and Deputy Lieutenant for Warwickshire. On the right of this group, we have Alfred, Alfred Frederick George Beresford Lumley, who was the 10th Earl of Scarborough and brother of Viscountess Newport. One interesting fact that I found while researching this talk is that the Earls of Scarborough own large areas of land around Skegness and were responsible for helping develop the, that town as a seaside resort. Moving on to the final photo, we have from left to right, Sir John Astley. He was in the Scots Fusilier Guards and served in the Crimean War. He married an heiress, Eleanor Corbett, and afterwards devoted himself to sports, including horse racing and boxing. He was the Conservative Member of Parliament for North Lincolnshire. He was a popular figure at race horse meetings and was known as the mate because of his sailor-like beard and bushy moustache. Most people who look at this painting why he is shown, wonder why he is shown from behind. I used to think that, that it was because he hadn't paid his bill, but during research for this talk I came across a number of images of Astley, all in the same costume, and I now think that even his back view would have been instantly recognisable. In the middle of this group we had Law Falmouth, who lived at Merewith Castle in Kent which was the site of a large and successful stud. Falmouth's horses won the Doncaster St. Ledger three times, so he must have known the town well. I always think of him as Victor Meldrew. Finally, we come to perhaps the most amazing character in the painting, Caroline Agnes Horsley Beresford, the Duchess of Montrose, who was a multi-millionaire -ess. She was known as the Red Duchess for both her scarlet racing colors and her habit of dressing from head to foot in that color at race meetings. In this painting, she is dressed in dark purple, possibly to indicate that she is still in mourning over the death of her second husband. A description of her, of her in 1888 stated, although she is a very grand dame to the very tips of her fingers, her appearance and her dress are very extraordinary. She is accustomed to call a spade a spade, to swear and curse like a trooper at times, and to thoroughly maintain her reputation for eccentricity. The Duchess was married three times, the third time at the age of 70 to a man aged 24. All in all, I think she must have been a fascinating character. Moving on to my next painting, we come to this atmospheric image of the cattle market in Doncaster, painted by Lionel Townsend Crawshaw in 1909. The painting measures four foot by three foot. The history of, history of Doncaster and its markets are interlinked, as the beginning of the town came about when people set up a trading post to service the Roman fort of Danum. The Roman fort was on, the, on, on almost exactly the same spot as the area shown in this painting, and in fact there are still some areas of Roman walls left in the grounds of the churchyard. The town and market grew from that time, with the first market charter granted to the town in 1193 by Richard I. The market has continued to flourish, flourish since then and now has around 400 stalls selling everything from fruit and veg to meat, fish and fabric. People think of Doncaster as an industrial area, 
but in fact it is set in the middle of wonderful agricultural land and much of the produce sold at the market was locally produced. This lovely photo shows a flock of sheep being driven past the town's guild hall on the way to the livestock sales. In fact, that the, road, the, the road that the sheep are walking down is the original Great North Road, which used to run right through the middle of Doncaster. If we look again at the painting, beside the animals, the scene is packed with farmers and their families having a chat. And this reminds me how much the market was, and still is to a certain extent, the social heart of the town. The cattle market moved during the 1960s and closed for good during the 1980s. And today the scene is quite changed with the car park occupying this area and the row of houses in the background, now the site of a Premier Inn. Those of you who have traveled through Doncaster on the train can't fail to have noticed the impressive church near the station. And that church, St George's, is the one that towers over the market in this painting. The church was designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott, the architect of St Pancras Station, and is a wonderful example of Victorian Gothic. It was built between 1853 and 1858 and replaced a medieval church that had been destroyed by fire two years earlier. We are lucky to have two drawings in our collection from the drawing office of Scott, showing his working designs for the church, and this is one of them. It's interesting to note that St George's was built at almost exactly the same time as the Palace of Westminster, and Doncaster obviously went for the best that was available because the church has much in, common with that, much, common, much in common with that famous London landmark. For example, the bells were cast by the Whitechapel foundry, who also cast Big Ben, and the clock was made by Denton Co of London, who made the clock on the face of the Palace of Westminster. There are lots of other fine features to the building, but it is worth mentioning the organ built by Schultz, which is one of the finest in the country. I'll leave the final word on the church to St. John, to son John Batchman, who described it as Victorian Gothic at its best. The artist Lionel Townsend Crawshaw was born in Doncaster. He went to Cambridge University where he studied law, afterwards qualifying as a solicitor. At that point, he had a radical change of career and took up art, studying in Dusseldorf and Paris. He then returned to Yorkshire and became a member of the Staithes Group, and it was during that period that this painting was created. Moving on to my next painting, I've cho chosen this wonderful image entitled Giants Refreshed, Pacifics in the Doncaster Locomotive Works by Terence Cunio. The picture measures four foot by three foot. Doncaster was one of the great railway towns of the 19th and 20th century, and this painting reflects the importance of the rail industry to the town. The painting was created in 1947 and shows the Crimsall paint shop at the Locomotive Works in Doncaster, with two locos having their final coats of paint being before being pressed back into service. It was created as a design for a poster to pr promote the services of LNER. In Cunio's autobiography, he talks about his visit to Doncaster saying, I was led wide-eyed into a huge and clean locomotive paint shop. There before me towered the magnificent Gresley Pacific, her body gleaming in fresh blue livery, whilst beside her and slightly in front stood an equally elegant A1 in contrasting LNER green. God, what a picture it made. As I said earlier, the painting was commissioned in 1947 as a design for a railway poster to promote LNER services. The poster proved so popular that it was reissued the following year, by which time the railway's companies had been nationalised. This poster is an example from 1948 of the British Rail Poster. Rather pleasingly, there are also some surviving drawings by Cunio made on his visit to Doncaster, and this is one of them. It is remarkably similar to the finished painting, apart from the position of the cat, who was apparently called Smudge. I thought it'd be nice to say just a little about the plant, the Doncaster Locomotive Works, which were always known locally as the plant. The works came to Doncaster in the early 1850s after relocating from Boston in Lincolnshire. The early site occupied around 11 acres, but by its height at the beginning of the 20th century, the site covered 200 acres, had 60 miles of sidings and employed around 4,500 people. In terms of locomotive building, the early years of the 20th century were its peak, when under the direction of Sir Nigel Gresley, world-famous locos like Flying Scotsman, Mallard and Cock of the North were built at Doncaster. As well as building locomotives, the plant work also overhauled locos, and it's been estimated that over 40,000 steam locos were overhauled and repaired at the plant. 
Nowadays, the size of the works is greatly reduced, but the overhaul of locomotives and rolling stock still takes place, including of London underground trains. After it was created, the painting belonged to Sir Ronald Matthews, who was the chairman of LNER. It descended through his family to his granddaughter, who put it up for sale at Burlington Paintings in London. The painting was seen there by a member of the museum staff who asked the gallery owner if he had told Heritage Doncaster that the painting was, sale, was, was for sale, to, to which he replied, no, because provincial museums never have any money. At that point, Heritage Doncaster contacted the dealer and it was agreed to take the painting off sale to allow us time to acquire it. Happily, we were able to do that with grants from the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Art Fund and the Friends of, and the Friends of Doncaster Museum again. Looking at the painting, I've always felt in some way that it's a painting of details and I just wanted to show some of them. This lovely section in the foreground shows the sight form and hand painting fire extinguishers. I love the way Cunio paints the tools of his trade and you can really feel, feel the paint dripping down the sides of the cans. The next detail shows two workers applying the finishing touches to the locust with what look like decorators brushes. It amazes me that the locusts were painted by hand. Finally, having helped to install some of the heavy nameplates on the wall in the Danum Gallery, the complete lack of health and safety in this detail always makes me smile. So far, I've chosen four paintings that all have a connection to Doncaster, but my next painting doesn't have the slightest connection to the town. I've chosen it because it's one of my favourites and because it brings together the life of two fascinating characters. The picture is a portrait of dancer choreographer Rupert Doon, painted by Nina Hamlet in 1922. I thought I'd begin by telling you a little bit about the sitter and the artist and then move on to the creation of the painting and how it ended up in Doncaster. <coughs> the sitter, Rupert Doon, was a dancer and choreographer and was around 20 years old when this picture was painted. Doon came from Redditch, where his father was a foreman in the needle factory. He moved to London at the age of 16 to begin his career as a dancer. To make ends meet, he modelled at the Royal Academy in the Slade, and it was probably during this period that he met Nina Hamlet. I've often wondered how true to life the portrait is, and have spent some time looking for photos of Doon as a young man, but with no success. But there are a number of prints and paintings of him, including these two woodcuts by Edward Wadsworth, in which his features seem very similar to those on the painting. From these images, you get the sense of how stylish and exotic he must have been, something like a 1920s version of David Bowie. At 19, Dune left London for Paris, where he danced with the Swedish ballet. At this time, he became the lover of Jean Cocteau. Later, he was the last premier dancer to be engaged by Serge Diaghilev for the Ballet Russe. So all in all, an incredible life for a young man from Redditch. As I said earlier, this painting brings together two remarkable individuals. We've already heard about Rupert Doon, but Nina Hamlet was just as extraordinary. This image shows Nina in a portrait from 1917 by Roger Fry. The painting hangs in the Courtauld Gallery. Hamlet was born in 1819 in Tenby, South Wales, and studied at art school in London, where tutors included George Clawson and Sir Frank Brangwyn. While in London, she met many of the leading arti artistic figures of the day, including Walter Sickert, Roger Fry and Ezra Pound. She also knew the occult system magician Alastair Crowley. In 1914, she went to Paris to continue her studies. On her first night there, or so the legend goes, she went to the Café La Rotonde, where the man at the next table introduced himself as Medigliani, painter and Jew. Her knowledge of Medigliani and his work is reflected in the slightly elongated features in the portrait of Doom. In, in addition to Medigliani, she also came to know Picasso, Serge Diaghilev and Jean Cocteau. One of the nice things about this picture is that we know exactly where it was painted and where Hamlet was living at the time. If we look at the back of the painting, it has this label in Hamlet's own hand. From it, we can tell that she was living at 8, Rue de la Grande Chaumière, which was next door to the Academy Colorossi, where the picture was painted. In her autobiography, Laughing Torso, Hamlet talks about the creation of the painting. She says, One day, Rupert Doon, the ballet dancer, came to Paris. He was just then beginning to dance. He was very poor and had posed for Cedric Morris and Dobson. He had a very fine head. He sat for the academies to make little money. 
I wanted to paint him. I did some drawings in the studio for which I paid him a little, but I could not afford to give him longer sittings. I introduced him to the pro professor of the Colorossi and he gave him a month sitting in the portrait class. The portrait class had not got a core libra and one had to have criticisms from the professor. This amused me as I had not been taught art in an art class for years. I started a small head which went very well. On Friday, the professor arrived. I've forgotten his name, but he was a well-known exhibitor at the spring exhibition. He was a sweet little man with a grey beard and he stared at me a lot and gave me a very good and true criticism. I took his advice and it, and it turned into, I think, one of my best portraits. It was bought in London in 1926 by Mr. Edward Marsh and is now in his collection. After Marsh's death, his collection passed to the Contemporary Art Society and they donated to the, this picture to Heritage Doncaster in 1963 to help us celebrate the opening of our previous museum. Now onto my final choice, which is this gorgeous little sculpture by the French artist Henri gaudier Brzeska, entitled Saint Amoureuse. The sculpture is carved from Saravatsa marble and measures just over a foot wide without its frame. This is another of the works that came to us through the Contemporary Art Society to celebrate the opening of our old museum. I've chosen it for a number of reasons. It's certainly one of my personal favourites and I never really go to grow tired of looking at it. Also, Although we only have a small sculpture collection, it's, it contains some of our most important works, and this is certainly one of them. Finally, it never ceases to amaze me that a sculpture by one of the most important models, modern sculptures of the early 20th, early 20th century, which has absolutely no connection to our town, should end up in Doncaster. Before we look at the sculpture in a little more detail, just a few words about the artist Henri gaudier Brzeska. He was born Henri Gaudier near Orléans in France in 1891. His father was a carpenter. In 1910, without any formal training, he took up sculpture in Paris. In the same year, he met Sophie Brzeska, a Polish woman with whom he lived from that time, both of them adopting the hyphenated name of Gaudier Brzeska. In 1911, they moved to London where Gaudier fell in with the vorticism, vorticism movement of Ezra Pound and Wyndham Lewis and became a founding member of the London Group. In 1912, after coming under the influence of Jacob Epstein, he began to believe that sculpture should leave behind the highly finished polished style of ancient Greece and embrace a more direct carving style. Between that time and 1914, he produced some of the most avant-garde sculptures being made in this country. At the start of the First World War, Gaudi enlisted with the French army, where he appears to have fought with little regard for his own safety. He was killed in the trenches at Nerville Saint Vast in 1915 at the age of only 23. When I think of Gaudia, in my mind, he's similar to Van Gogh. He was very much an outsider who had an overwhelming drive to produce art and whose life ended much too soon. So let's go back and have another look at the sculpture in a little more detail. As I said, the sculpture is a low relief and is carved from Saravatsa marble, which comes from the west of Tuscany, not too far from the more famous Carrera marble quarries. Gaudia never had much money, and many of his sculptures were carved from leftover pieces of marble given to him by other sculptors. This might help to explain the strange shape of our sculpture. We think the sculpture dates from 1914. This is based on a list of works with, with dates that Gaudia made in that year. Having said that, it is similar in style to a series of low reliefs that he made in 1913. One thing that makes this sculpture particularly interesting in Gaudia's work it is, is that it is one of the only ones for which there is a surviving drawing. That drawing belongs to the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I thought it might be nice to see the drawing and the sculpture side by side so we can compare them. In the sculpture, Gaudia brings the two figures much close together and really emphasises the strength of the woman's right arm and hand as they take the weight of her body. It might sound like a strange thing to say, but to my mind at least, there is more of a sense of anatomy and volume in the drawing than there is in the sculpture. It also seems to me that in the sculpture, the male figure loses some of his sense of menace. It's interesting to mention at this point that the sculpture has had a number of titles during its history. In Gaudia's original list, it was called Saint d'Amour, but in the valuations of his estate after it was died, it was called Adam and Eve. 
Later it was known as nude man and woman. Before I finish, just a little bit about the history of the sculpture. At the end of the First World War, a memorial exhibition of Gaudi's works was, was held at the Leicester Galleries in London. The exhibition contained over 100 works and the catalogue had an introduction by Ezra Pound. This work was purchased from that exhibition by Frank Stoop, who was a Dutch stock bro broker and art collector living in London. The sculpture stayed with Stoop until his death in 1933 at which time it passed to the Contemporary Art Society. At that point, the sculpture disappeared from view and didn't reappear until it was donated to Heritage Doncaster in 1963. So that brings an end to my talk. Hope you've all enjoyed listening. Thanks for your questions as well. And it would really be lovely to see some of you um, in Doncaster at some time. Um, we're open six days a week in our new building, including on late night on a Thursday, well, till seven o'clock anyway. Um, and the other thing to say that if you're interested in visiting and, and you uh, want to see a particular work, perhaps something that you've seen on the Art UK website, please contact the gallery in advance. And if it's not on display, we can definitely allow you access to see it in the storerooms. So we'd love to see you all. And um, thank you very much.